Welcome to our online Sunday service once again here at Ridgeway Community Church, Redditch. We're very pleased to have Peter Coggins from Wood Green Evangelical Church sharing with us from God's Word and another episode in the life of the disciple of Jesus called Simon Peter. Glad you can join us. Trust you'll be blessed as we join together in the singing of hymns and in prayer and especially hearing the Word of God. Let's begin then, shall we, with this lovely song of praise to our God.
Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, you are worthy of our adoration and our praise. Amen. And so, Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit, and your worthiness does not depend upon the circumstances of our own lives, nor the circumstances of the lives of others. Your worthiness is simply that you are worthy far above all, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders, unchanging in your purpose, unfailing in your love, unequalled in the apportioning of your grace. And we thank you that we can know that lovely sufficiency of your grace as we come to to give you our praise and our thanks mm -hmm. to bow before you as lord of all and to acknowledge you as lord of our own lives thank you for your faithful keeping your ongoing enabling of us from day to day thank you for bringing us together here this morning at ridgeway community church and Father, we're mindful of those not with us, praying for them, whatever hinders or hampers them at this time. Lord, will you draw near to them and strengthen them in the faith? Father, will you draw others to come too? And will you bring others to the Lord Jesus Christ? They will be drawn to you to believe and to acknowledge your worth father how how dull is our hearing how blurred is our vision at times failing to see who you are in all the wonder of your being and your amazing love that you have shown to us in jesus christ in his coming into the world to save sinners such as ourselves will you draw near to us in our need this morning and those who are watching online the recording will you bless us all and strengthen us all and grant to us to feel the warmth of your unchanging love toward us help us as we pray help us as we sing help us as we hear your word read and as your word is proclaimed work a great work in our midst it might seem to some looking from the outside in that not a great number of people but lord the one who is the greatest of all is here in the midst and it is to you that we lift our voice this morning in jesus name amen, amen.
Hi everyone, good to be together in the name of Jesus our Saviour, for sure. Um, okay, so I just wanted to bring a very simple few words to us all, um, young and old, this morning. Um, are we swayed by external pressure or internal conviction? That's the question. Really, um, I believe that to make a difference in this world, in whatever situation comes at us, we need to function from internal conviction rather from, than from external pressure. And I just thought of the wonderful story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, three young men able to, uh, to function from their internal conviction. So obviously they were told to bow the knee, along with everybody else, to bow the knee before this huge statue, 90 foot high, 90 feet wide, of this very egotistical uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, who thought so much of himself. And of course they refused, because they knew that they should be bowing the knee before the living and true God, and not uh, King, King Nebuchadnezzar's idol. So Nebuchadnezzar, so here, become, here comes the external pressures because obviously there were all the people there, there, were King Nebu, there was King Nebuchadnezzar who was in a rage because they wouldn't do what he told them to, they could probably smell the furnace, the, the, the heat of the furnace probably they could feel, and there was their own position because they had good positions in, in, in that world, uh, and they would lose all of that as obviously along with their lives. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar uh, told them what he would do to them uh, and they said if that is the case our God who is able who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace so they put that out there he is able to deliver us from your hand O king uh, but if not Okay, so they knew that, that, you know, God might deliver them, but God might choose not to. If not, O oh king, just, just let it be known that we do not serve your gods, neither will we worship the gold image that you have set up. So Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and he ends up throwing them in the fiery furnace. Now, we know what happens, but just the, the point of these few words is to put ourselves in that position. We will probably never actually, you never know, but you, we probably will never be thrown into a fiery furnace, but there will be equivalent type things in our lives. But we need to ask ourselves, are we going to be like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and function from our internal conviction that we will not, um, we will not bow the knee to whatever God it is that we are being pressured to serve. I just wanted to finish off with a few words from this chap. Uh, Studdett Kennedy, Geoffrey Studdett Kennedy, otherwise known as Woodbine Willie. He was uh, an Anglican minister and a pastor in Worcester in England, also a chaplain in World War I, and he's written some very beautiful poems uh, and letters and, and, and lots of things. Um, he, he was a poet and a pastor and a chaplain and as a chaplain he had to go to the war and he had to leave his family he had a little son and he wrote a letter to his little son from the trenches of France where he was in the midst of very serious warfare this is what he said the first prayer I want my son to learn is to say for me is not that the prayer that he wants him to say for him is God not he doesn't want him to say God keep daddy safe 
The first prayer I want my son to learn is, God, make, <clears throat> make daddy brave. And if he has hard things to do, make him strong to do them. Life and death don't matter, son. Right and wrong do. Daddy dead is daddy still, but daddy dishonoured before God is something too awful for words. <laughs> During the year, the Christian Institute have a more than one week of prayer, but this is the beginning of 
a week of prayer, praying for our nation and the situations in our country. Um, you can access them at christian.org if you want. If you don't already, um, subscribe to their mailing list. And so the matter for prayer today, they're asking churches and individuals to pray for our leaders. And we should pray for our leaders. And they're asking that we pray for integrity and wisdom for King Charles, for the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, for the First Ministers um, in the UK and all those in national and local government and to pray that parliamentarians and assembly members will promote what is good and restrain, from, restrain evil and also to pray that the Lord would raise up more leaders in our national life who follow Christ. And when we ask these things we ask in faith, don't we, and expectation as we come to him so let's uh, join together, shall we, in, in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the good news about Jesus going out into the world. Thank you for those who indeed have that burning inner conviction that drives them to make a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ uncompromisingly and yet compassionately. Father, we thank you for the work of the gospel in Ukraine. I want to pray again for Martin Tatham and the team have gone out there with meeting with Polish pastors and going into Ukraine to bring encouragement to their brothers and sisters there. Will you help them and watch over them and in the evident weariness of those labouring so hard in such difficult circumstances Will you strengthen their hand and embolden them within? Will you pour out upon them your Holy Spirit? We thank you, Lord, for the news of many people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ through the ministry of your people there in Ukraine. Thank you for the courage of men and women, not only to stand up for the gospel, but also to put themselves in positions which are potentially so dangerous to them in order that they might reach out to others and bring help and comfort and the good news about Jesus. Father, we pray that there will be many sons and daughters brought to glory, even in the midst of that conflict. And we pray, Lord, for the team's families back home. Pray that you will give them peace and bring their loved ones safely back to them, we pray, at the end of this time. Father, we pray for our own land and the evident ungodliness. Father, we pray for King Charles we thank you that this man has heard the gospel. Father, I know of one person at least who has face to face spoken with King Charles. We pray that your word might take root in his heart. And Lord, he might boldly stand for the faith for the Lord Jesus Christ the son of the living God and your only beloved son one with you and the Holy Spirit whom you've given pray for Rishi Sunak by profession Hindu I believe 
Oh Lord, that men in high places and women in positions of authority might bow the knee before the only true God and leave idolatry and place their hope in the living God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, for all our members of Parliament, leaders of councils, of influential organisations. Lord, will you humble the proud heart? Will you convict the guilty? Oh Lord, will you do for those men and women as you have done for some of us and saved us from our sins? And yet, Lord, we ask that you would overrule in the decision-making processes whereby so often your ways are ignored, brazenly contradicted. Lord, we pray that you would overrule and bring righteousness that exalts a nation. Your word tells us that, and that sin is a disgrace to any people. Oh, Lord, will you make them instruments to restrain evil and promote that which is good and wholesome and lovely. And Father, we pray that you would raise up in our communities, in our land, men and women whose heart is set upon you, who believe on you, who love you and want to serve you. Remember too, Lord, Hannah Coggins, there in Chad, to strengthen this child of yours in her ministry, fulfilling her calling. And Lord, the sometimes insurmountable challenges, for so it seems in our limited perspective, pray you will show her that you are the overcomer, and that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. So Father, strengthen her, help her coping with the weather conditions, the cultural challenges, the linguistic issues, the responsibility of preparation for teaching, for management within the school setting. And draw close to those children, we pray, those precious little ones entrusted to her care and the care of the staff. There we pray. And thank you for the little, short, brief life of Boaz, whom you granted to us. Will you comfort David and Annika? And Kezia? And not only for today, but for tomorrow and the days that lie before them in their grief and sense of loss in which we share Alistair, Lydia, myself, Joy, uncles, aunts, wider family, church folk, so many who have expressed concern, have devoted time to pray for help. Lord, we bow before you in humble adoration knowing, Lord, that to say your will be done is the finest and the best in submission to you. For, Lord, you give. For us, that is not a difficulty. You give. Lord, you take away. And, Lord, in this instance, Boaz, you have taken 
And we know you have taken him to be with yourself. Lord, you love and you care. We do not have to understand, to trust, nor to love. It is enough for us that, Lord, you have given and that you have taken. And so we would, with tears, say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good to be with you again uh, today. We're continuing our studies in the life of the Apostle Peter. Today we're in John chapter 21. Following on from what Lydia said, we last time we saw Peter succumbing to external pressures, but uh, the title of today's message will be Failure Isn't Final. Um, and it certainly wasn't for Peter. So uh, be encouraged if we have succumbed to external pressures, which I'm sure we can identify with. Um, the Lord doesn't leave us in that state. John 21, verse 1. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of coals there, a fire of burning coals there, with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. <coughs> the third time he said to him, Son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, 
Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. And Jesus says to us, doesn't he, follow me. And I didn't choose this hymn, but it's very appropriate. Because our response to that is, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Let's pray. Father, we've just dedicated our lives to you in that hymn, and Lord, part of that is listening to your word and following what it says. And Lord, we thank you for your word. So we pray now as we come to it, Lord, by the guidance and power of your Holy Spirit, you will speak to every single one of us and help us, Lord, not just to hear your word, but to put it into practice in our lives for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, last time uh, when I was here, we left Peter weeping bitterly outside the high priest's house because he had denied that he knew Jesus three times. We can feel for him in that, I know. We can understand the pressures he was under uh, and the prospects of following Jesus at that point to, to the cross is where Jesus was going. When was the, when, I wonder, when was the last time your relationship with Jesus caused you to weep? If ever. Is it because... Like Peter, you have failed him and let him down through sin? Or is it through external 
circumstances, through tragedy. And we wonder why has God allowed this and we weep. Or because we've been let down by somebody. In the darkest of times, whether they're of our own making or whether we just because we live in a broken world, we need to see what Jesus is doing. And what he's doing in this passage is inviting you to breakfast. It's quite surprising, isn't it? You might think he might be doing all kinds of things, but that's what he's doing. Uh, verse 12, Jesus said to them, Come, and have breakfast. Don't worry, you had for breakfast. You probably didn't have fish sandwiches, which is what uh, the disciples are going to have for breakfast. What a lovely thing to have breakfast with Jesus. A lot's happened since Peter's denials. Jesus has been tried, he's been condemned, he's been crucified. He has risen from the dead. He has appeared to his disciples, including Peter. John tells us uh, right at the end here, verse 14, this is now the third time that Jesus has appeared to his disciples. However, there's still unfinished business. He has to deal with Peter's previous failure directly. And this is what he's going to do now. If you'd let somebody down really badly, would you expect them to invite you to breakfast? Well, it depends what they're like, but uh, maybe not. It can often be the end of a relationship, can't it? And grudges and resentments last for a very long time. But the Lord is not one to bear grudges, is he? He is gracious, he is forgiving, he is kind. But he doesn't let it go. He doesn't overlook sin. He puts it right. What Peter got was an invitation to breakfast to those fish sandwiches, which I'm sure he loved because it was what he put he ate most days. And our previous pastor at Wood Green was uh, Paul Mallard. Some of you know Paul Mallard. I've heard his preaching. Um, and he was a man of catchphrases, and I borrowed one today. And that is, failure isn't final. I've heard him say that a number of times. And what a blessing it is to, to hear that, isn't it? Because I have failed many times. But it's not final. <coughs> In a previous chapter in John, in chapter 16, verse 32, Jesus had predicted that after his death, his disciples would, ret would return to their own homes. They would be scattered and they would go back home. And that's exactly what happens here. We've got a whole list of them, haven't we? Uh, well, some are named, some are not, uh, in verse 2. And they've gone back to Galilee, which is their home territory. And Peter decides... Um, to uh, fill, in, fill in the time as he's by the Sea of Galilee to, to go back to fishing. That's his uh, livelihood, that's his business, that's what he's familiar with. So he goes back to that and um, he decides to go fishing. Jesus decides to restore Peter to his rightful position. And there are three steps in this restoration of Peter to his rightful position as an apostle of Jesus. And the first step consists of reminders. The sights, sounds, smells can bring back memories, can't they? You might hear a piece of music and they, oh, that reminds me of something, or um, you smell um, perfume that reminds you of some person. These things can be quite powerful in bringing back memories, can't they? They can be good memories, or they could be bad memories. And Jesus here actually uses all, all Peter's senses 
to remind him of some good things and some bad things. Four reminders in this passage. I wonder if you spotted them as you read it. Things you thought, oh, I've, I've, I've heard that, I've seen that somewhere else before. But the reminders are there, whether it's good things or bad things, they're there for a good purpose. To go forward with Jesus, sometimes we need to face our past. First reminder is a reminder of sight. And I think probably as we read this, this would call a memory back to you as well, because something we looked at in a previous message. And that's the miraculous catch of fish. Verse 4. <clears throat> We'll read at the end of verse 3. They laboured all night and they caught nothing. We've read that before, haven't we? And verse 4, early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise it was Jesus, and he called out to them, friends, literally children, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of a large number of fish. A miraculous catch. And when that happens, verse 7, John, as the disciple whom Jesus loved, realises that this is Jesus standing on the shore. It is the Lord, he says. An almost exact copy of a miracle had happened way back in Peter's life, right at the beginning of his time with Jesus, when they were labouring all night, they caught nothing, and Jesus said, throw your net on the other side, and they had this enormous catch of fish. And they recognised it was the Lord. And what did Peter say on that occasion? Do you remember that? I don't know why I preached it, quite a long time ago, I think. But what did Peter say? He said, Lord, depart from me, because I am a sinful man. And when those, when those fish came into it, I wonder if you remember that conversation. Because did Jesus depart from him on that occasion? No, quite the opposite. He commissioned him to be a fisher of men. And Peter's let him down again. He's very much aware of his sin. And here's this miracle, and maybe he's about to say the same words, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. But Jesus is standing there on the shore, inviting him to breakfast. What a gracious saviour we have. I don't know if you uh, follow horse racing or follow the, uh, the Grand National. <laughs> Not the, the best of sports, perhaps, but... Um, we can be like the, like the horses that fall at the first fence. And what does Jesus do? He picks us up and says, you've got the next fence to get over now. For those of you who know my uh, preaching, whenever I'm preaching, hymns come into my head, I don't know why. But one's just come into my head, it's not my notes, it says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the Lord I love. We're like Peter, aren't we? You know, those external pressures that Lydia spoke about. You know, we want to be like Chad, that Meshach and Abednego. But I'm more like Peter. But the Lord's the same Lord. He was with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the furnace. And he's with Peter here on the shores of the Lake of Galilee where it all started saying, come and have breakfast. Come and eat with me. <coughs> so they do. And what do we experience now? We've got a, um, a memory of smell. Because verse 9, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. When our neighbours have a barbecue, we all know what they're doing. <laughs> it's a very distinctive smell, isn't it? 
and the charcoal fire would have a very distinctive smell. When's the last time Peter was standing around a charcoal fire? In the courtyard of the high priest. Warming himself. And as he comes ashore, and there's the fire, and he feels the warmth of the fire, perhaps on a chilly Galilee morning, he's bound to remember, isn't he? He's bound to remember that desperate night. The Lord wants us to be aware of our sins and our failings, not because he's come to destroy and condemn us, but because he's come to rescue and renew us. The way to Jesus is to be aware of our faults, not to pretend they're not there, and then in his strength and power to overcome them, and know his forgiveness and his gracious restoration. And that's what's happening to Peter around the charcoal fire on the beach. Jesus is tenderly restoring him. And then what happens? He says, uh, bring some of the fish. There's already fish, there's already, there's already fish there. But he says, now bring a contribution. They've got a large cash, catch. Uh, John tells us 153. Many people have tried to interpret that number. I'm not going to because I don't think it means anything other than to show... It was a miracle. And not just that, but John was there as a witness, as an eyewitness. He, he, he gives you the details, say, I was there, I saw this happen, you can believe it, it is true. Jesus performed this miracle. Bring some of the fish. So to bring the fish, verses 10 to 14, verse 10, 11, so Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. I could have called this, um, given that title of his sermon, that you like it's a nice title, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Third reminder, verse 13, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. What does that remind you of? Almost exactly the same words are used in the feeding of the 5,000. He took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Wouldn't have, been that, wouldn't have been that far away. It was on a, uh, on a hillside by the Sea of Galilee where Jesus fed the 5,000. And John chapter 6 verse 11 says, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. But John then goes on to record uh, the teaching that Jesus gave after he had fed the 5,000. And in verse uh, 35 he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Remember those words, because I'm going to come back to them. Uh, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. And there was that issue after the resurrection, wasn't there? Some saw him, but they didn't believe. They still doubted he'd actually risen from the dead. All those the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Or in the older translation, he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. After he fed the 5,000, he said, I am the bread of life. I am the one who will sustain you in your walk with me, and I will never drive you away. Even though you're going to fall and you're going to fail, he who comes to me, I will never cast out. And here's this miracle sort of call to mind as he feeds them with the bread and the fish. 
and distributed amongst them. Remember, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who comes to me will never be thirsty. He who comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Even if you fall at the first hurdle, I'll pick you up and you'll go on. And you'll reach the finishing line. You may not come in first place, but you'll finish because it's the work of Jesus, not our own effort, that gets us there, isn't it? That was acting on the sense of taste, wasn't it? And then, uh, then the sound, what Jesus actually says. Three times then, verse 15 to 17. When he had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter. He's got both names here. He's got his original name, his human name, if you like, and he's got his spiritual name that Jesus gave him, Peter. And we're a mixture of both, aren't we? Sinful nature and renewed spirit. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? A lot of debate about what he meant by these. I go down the line, he's talking about these other disciples. Yes, Lord, he said, you know what, I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? <clears throat> After the reminders, and this is the last reminders, we have the reinstatement. Jesus is asking Peter if he loves him more than the other disciples, because he has said he, he would, didn't he? Remember what he said? Mark 14, 29, he says, even if all fall away, I will not. That was his boast before the trial of Jesus, before his arrest. That's what he says. I love you more than all these, is what he was saying, wasn't he? But in Mark 14, 29, even if all fall away, I won't. But he did. So Jesus asked him, do you love me more than these? And Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Just because we, mess, we may mess up and get things wrong doesn't mean we don't love the Lord. It means there's a battle going on in our hearts, isn't there? But our attitude to our failures will reveal our heart. When we get things wrong, when we let the Lord down, what is our attitude? G Peter went out and wept bitterly. That revealed his heart, didn't it? Judas went out and hung himself. That revealed his heart. Though like chalk and cheese, they were totally different people. There was no renewal in Judas's heart. But Peter, he was weak and he failed, but he still loved Jesus. And we can be like that, can't we? Doesn't mean you don't love Jesus just because you, you fail and get things wrong. The third time Peter adds, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus isn't asking this question because he's after information. I mean, he knows our hearts. But he wants Peter to declare it for himself. And that's what, that's what he knows whether we love him or not, but he wants to hear him say it. Doesn't he? he wants to, us to hear it, wants us to hear it say to him that we love him. We want to confess with our own lips our relationship with Jesus. He knows it anyway, but we need to speak it out. Now in this passage, in the original language, there are two different words for love are used. Some people say that there's nothing in that, but I, but I, I think there is. Because John, John heard the conversation, the conversation would, would have been, even the Greek New Testament is a translation, 
because the original language spoken was Aramaic. Jesus, John heard the conversation and he chose to write down two different Greek words in recording it. And I think that's, there must be significance in that. So let me just explain what they are. So one word for love is, is sort of a human, human kind of love, you no know, affection for people. And the other word is God's divine love. And the first, first conversation, verse 15, when Jesus says, do you love me? He says, do you love me as God loves? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I have affection for you. He's changing the word. He can't love as God loves, but he loves, I, I have affection. The second conversation is exactly the same. Jesus, second time, says, do you love as God loves? And Peter replies, yes, Lord, I love with human love. I have affection for you. The third time, verse 17, Jesus changes the word and says, do you love with your love? On your level, if you like. And Peter's hurt when he says the third time. And he says, Lord, you know that I love you. I have affection for you. Jesus, if you like, has dropped the level. He say, are you still loving me on, on your level? When Jesus asks him the third time, Peter's hurt. Why is he hurt? Is he hurt because Jesus has changed the word? Or is he hurt because it's the third time and it reminds him of the three denials? I think it's probably a bit of both. Now, if somebody asks you the same thing three times, you know, sometimes you get uh, journalists asking politicians and they don't get a straight answer, so they ask, keep on asking, keep on asking them, and the politicians get a bit uh, hot under the collar that they keep being asked the same question. Uh, and, Jesus, and Peter's been asked the same question three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? And you can imagine getting a, a bit miffed by that. But I think it's probably because Jesus is reversing the three denials, isn't he? I don't know the man, I don't know the man, I don't know the man. I love you, I love you, I love you. Putting it right, isn't it? Not on you know, God's level, but on my own level, I love you, Jesus. And we can't do any more than that, can we? And Jesus accepts that in the third question. And then thirdly, Having been reminded of failure, having been reinstated in his position as an apostle, there's a recommissioning. Because <clears throat> I missed the bits out in between. In response to uh, these declarations of love, Jesus gives a threefold command. Verse 15, feed my lambs. Verse 16, take care of my sheep. And verse 17, feed my sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd, but he appoints people under shepherds to look after his flock. And that's what Peter is called to be here, isn't it? And slight changes of words, lambs and sheep, feeding, taking care, all ages, all stages, are under the pastor's care, aren't they? Not just ages chronologically but spiritual ages those who are new in the faith those who are more experienced in the faith those who are safe in the fold and those who are wandering off a bit the pastors care aren't they teaching feeding is teach, teaching feeding the sheep teaching them through God's word how are we nourished Jesus says I am the bread of life it's, God, it's God's word which nourishes the sheep we all need that, don't we? We need to be taught. However old we might be in the faith, we need still, we're still learning. You know, the word disciple, I said this before, means a learner. Teaching, but also taking care of the sheep, pastoral care. 
I know you pray for your pastor, but we need to pray for our pastors because particularly in the days in which we live, all kinds of difficult situations people are in and the great wisdom and care in uh, taking care of God's children, isn't it? And that was going to be Peter's role from now on. He's a fisher of men, but also he's a pastor. Admitting our weaknesses and failures doesn't disqualify us in the Lord's service. It strengthens us. And there's one more simple command given to Peter in verse 19. Follow me. That's what we do with shepherds, isn't it? A sheep follow the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Um, he leads me in green pastures and beside still waters. Literally, um, the Greek word means keep following me. Not something we do once, it's something we do day by day. We keep following him. In Luke 22, 23, 33, we looked at this last time, Peter had said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And then he went in the courtyard and denied him three times. All that, that promise went up in smoke, literally, in the courtyard. But Jesus is saying, actually, you will go with me to prison and to death. That's what verse 18 is about. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands. And that's an expression for crucifixion. It was used in those days to mean crucifixion. You will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. <coughs> it's not in the Bible, but the historians of the day tell us that Peter was crucified in Rome. In fact, he felt so humbled he asked to be crucified head downwards because he couldn't uh, be the same as his Lord. That bold statement, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death, was fulfilled. Jesus predicts it here in verse 18. His inner convictions overcame it the external pressures in the end. He had another opportunity. He was faithful to the end. And his death in itself was not glorious, but in verse 19, it brought glory to God. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death for which Peter would glorify God. And what glorifies God is not our circumstances, but our attitude to our circumstances. And God took Peter safely to a better breakfast. Jesus is not inviting you to fish sandwiches by the Lake of Galilee. You might be glad to know that. <laughs> But Revelation 19 verse 9 says, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's a glorious invitation, isn't it? No more sorrow or failures, no more tragedies, no more betrayals, no more broken hearts at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the way to, to get to that wedding supper, that great banquet, heaven is often described as a banquet in the Bible, isn't it? A feast we can't imagine. The way to get there is by listening and obeying those words of Jesus, follow me. And keep following him. The news recently has all been about, um, will he or won't he? Will he accept the invitation to the coronation or not? Well, finally, how he has. 
maybe somewhat reluctantly, we don't know. But when Peter had the, uh, the invitation to breakfast, he literally jumped at the chance. He jumped out the boat, didn't he? he ran towards Jesus. And the very last words in the Bible, the very last command in the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. Remember Jesus said, uh, after the feeding of the 5,000, if anyone is thirsty, if anyone is hungry, come to me. That's the invitation, isn't it? That's what he's offering. Whatever our life might be like, whatever our life may have been, life, been like, the opportunity is still there. The invitations to, a, uh, to the coronation had a reply date by April the 3rd, I think it was. Harry missed that. He went over it, but he was still welcome and he still came. The invitation that Jesus offers to us is still there. It will end one day, won't it? When we end. But the invitation is there, come. Failure isn't final. It's a new day, it's a new offer. Jesus says, come to the glories of heaven, to the glories of eternal life. But to do that, you have to follow him and not go your own way. Yesterday, uh, Jean and I, were, we went to visit friends in Oxfordshire. And um, on the way back, we, 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 uh, we set the sat-nav to, to home, because that's where we want to be. We want to be home, isn't it? And heaven is our home. We set the sat-nav to home, and we started off, and we followed it, and we got to the M40, and we thought, oh, we know where we are now. So we turned it off, and we said, we don't need it anymore. And some Christians are like that. Then they come to Jesus and they start off and say, oh, well, I'm okay now, I'll, I'll go my own way. And they're, they're still Christians, but they miss out on the blessings and they'll take wrong turns because they're not following Jesus. <coughs> Follow me, Jesus says. Keep following me. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. Get rid of anything that hinders. Follow me. Because I have a breakfast waiting for you. I have a banquet waiting for you. I have the glories of eternal life waiting for you. Follow me. Rock of ages, work for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from the river's Irish flow be a sin the double cure. Thank you.
fly. Watch me say your Lord I While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I saw Let's pray. Father, grant that your word may lodge deep within our hearts and minds today and that truly we would follow Jesus every day of our life. Amen. Well, it's been good, hasn't it, to listen to God's Word, and I hope you'll take that to heart and ponder the things that you have heard today. Next week, we have a special meeting. We welcome two, uh, well, a couple who are going out to Spain as missionaries, having served the Lord in Peru. So it's going to be a really interesting time, and um, our brother will share from God's Word as well. And they are linked to the European Missionary Fellowship. So we look forward to welcoming them. And I hope you'll join us again. God bless you.